Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. So we are here coming to you live from downtown Atlanta at the Georgia State University Double Read Day, and we are with our host, Laura Dahl. Laura, tell us a little bit about what's going on today and the history of this awesome event. So I started this in 2010, and it was just an idea that I had. I saw all these other universities doing Double Read Days, and I thought, well, I want to do that. I didn't really know how to do it, though. It's not like there was ever a class in college that said, this is how you have a Double Read Day. So I, um, I emailed Martin Schuring and Jeff Lyman, and I said, hey, I want to do this. Will you guys come for free? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, yes. <laughs> I said, I'll pay for your airfare, but because um, we were completely self-funded. So they mm-hmm. came, and it was huge. We had 50 kids that first year. It was this gigantic event, and I think it's, it's an ideal location. It's downtown Atlanta. And it's, you know, in the heart of the, of the arts, mm-hmm. and it's just a really fantastic location. So I've been doing it since then. Um, we've had some amazing guest artists, and I've always just emailed people and hoped that they would come. So Bert Lucarelli, I emailed him. He didn't know me, and I said, we do this double read day. I can't pay you much. Could you come? And he said, yes. I've just found that people are so generous and mm-hmm. kind in our field. Mm-hmm. They really are. So Bert Ligarelli, Lenny Hindell, Nancy Ambrose King, Bill Ludwig, um, Albie Mickleish, and we just had this huge lineup of amazing people, and I've had the opportunity to meet them and become friends with them and work with them, and it's been an amazing opportunity. For the students, we generally have middle schoolers and high schoolers. We've changed things over the years. We now have a beginning track and an advanced track, which I think is really ideal. Mm -hmm. It allows for the younger players to find a place. Mm -hmm. They can play double read music that's accessible to them. We do, I do an extra master class that does the fundamentals as does the bassoon teacher. Mm -hmm. And then we join in with the the guest artist master class where they're with the advanced students. And it's been really fantastic. We have vendors that come. They are so supportive, so wonderful. Shauna Lake from Oboe Chicago has been here since 2010. She's come every year, and it's just a really exciting day. Awesome. Well, we're so excited to be a part of this great lineage, this star-studded <laughs> lineage. Um, so this is just the intro. The rest of the episode, we're going to have time with Laura. She's mm-hmm. going to answer some questions for us. Her bassoon colleague, John Grove, is going to answer some questions for us. And then we're going to hang out with the participants. We're going to give them a chance to tell us their perspective on double read playing and just have some fun. So keep listening for this Live from Georgia State, episode of Double Read Dish. We are so excited to welcome to our first ever live podcast, John Grove, instructor of bassoon at Georgia State University. Welcome, John. Hi, how are you guys doing? Doing great. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and how you came to the bassoon in the first place? Yeah, actually, um, it's kind of weird. I just kind of fell into the bassoon, I guess I would say. So I'm the son of two orchestral musicians. My mom was a violinist and my dad was a bassoonist in Symphony Nova Scotia. And um, I started out on clarinet, and uh, I used to also play a piano in the jazz band in high school, and I really wanted a keyboard for Christmas one year. And when I looked under the Christmas tree, there was this alligator skin case that wasn't <laughs> quite big enough for, uh, for a keyboard. When I opened it up, it was a bassoon, a Schreiber bassoon. Um, with not the, a keyboard. Not a keyboard, <laughs> no. And so it was, like, it was 10th grade. I was like, well, what am I going to do with that? Um, but the, 
I mean, my dad was a bassoonist, so of course he wanted me to play bassoon. And um, the youth orchestra in Nova Scotia, they needed a bassoon player, and so I transitioned from clarinet to bassoon, you know, in half a year. Um, I just loved it. It was a lot of fun, and um, the youth orchestra was an amazing experience, and then I just decided to continue that in college. So your dad is a bassoon player, and that must have got translated into your DNA somehow, because it is my understanding that you're married to a bassoonist, and both of your offspring are bassoonai, <laughs> and... So what is the bassoon connection here? What do you think is the... Is it genetic in uh, bassoons in your blood? What? And it, how many reeds are like in going on in the house at any time? And do you play quartets? Like We do. We play um, uh, bassoon quartets at Christmas. We go to nursing homes and oh, do that. Oh, I love it. Um, but yeah, I met my wife at a bassoon symposium, which is crazy. We met at the John Miller Bassoon Symposium in 1994. Okay. Um, and then, you know, we started having kids when they came of age to choose an instrument, um, my oldest, Chandler, he was like, well, I'd like to try clarinet or percussion. And I was his band director because I also have another life of teaching middle school and high school band. Um, I'm like, well, you know, why don't we at least try the bassoon? <laughs> and he loved it, which was, which was great. And so he still plays bassoon now. He's uh, going to Georgia, Georgia Tech and plays in their symphonic band. Um, and uh, then his younger brother, when it came time for him, we want we like to handicap all our kids with double reed instruments. So <laughs> we didn't want them to be in competition, so we actually got him an oboe. Okay. Um, and then when it was time for class to start, he's like, you know, you never really asked me, <laughs> and I just kind of want to do bassoon too. Oh no. And so uh, he's currently a senior in high school and still plays bassoon. Amazing. Um, more under duress now at the moment, but you know. <laughs> Same. Then, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the case for every at some point, I guess. Um, and then my uh, my oldest saw I was actually dating a bassoon player as well, so oh it's oh pretty crazy. We played quartets with him and his girlfriend <laughs> last week. Is he going to be totally embarrassed right now? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more about your training and educational journey and how you came to Georgia State. Um, okay, so I went to Acadia University in Nova Scotia, um, and then when I graduated. You know, at that point, I was, uh, you know, already connected with uh, my wife, and I moved down here and, um, you know, just started getting into freelancing and everything. And so I've freelanced in Atlanta for, what is it, 22 years now or so, and I've been, I was invited to uh, the Georgia State faculty um, about four years ago. So, and I've had a great time here, really wonderful kids, and it's a great working place, a lot of fun. So you're here at Georgia State, as you mentioned, you also are a band director, and one thing we really strive to do with Double Read Dish is to be a resource for students and colleagues in the field alike. Um, so could you tell us maybe about something, a challenge you've had in your career or a musical struggle um, that you've overcome, or even as a pedagogue or teacher, um, something that you've had to kind of address and overcome in the course of your career? Yeah, well... You know, I've been very fortunate to be in a in an area where there's a lot of freelancing to be done. So, um, you know, but the challenge has really been just to hone my craft. And if I if I were to really single in on one thing, it's I have a really slow tongue. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So Same. it's important for me to be able to know how to double tongue, and um, it's just a challenge. You know, for everybody out there who's tried it, you know, it doesn't come naturally for most of us. Mm -hmm. I'd say. Um, I will say, though, that when I was learning to play all of my instruments, I didn't actually tongue on the reed to begin with. Like, I started on recorder before clarinet. Mm -hmm. Then when they gave me a clarinet, it's like they didn't tell me I was supposed to tongue on the reed. Now when I moved to bassoon, oh, no. they didn't tell me I needed to tongue on the reed. So it wasn't until partway through 12th grade that somebody said, you know, are you actually tonguing on the reed? Do you feel your tongue touching the reed? And I said, no. I'm like, well, you're supposed to do that. I'm like, what? That seems crazy. Um, I know, but it's like, like gross. but you can't see, I mean, you can't see in somebody's mouth. So actually, Correct, yeah. if I hear an unclear articulation, I always ask, do you feel your tongue touching the reed? Yes. Um, and most of the time they are, but you know, every now and then you still catch somebody who's not. Um, but anyway, going back to learning how to double tongue, um, my wife and I were hired to play, um, with the Atlanta Opera and there was a section where just the bassoons were playing. We we're both playing in unison, um, but it was super fast, and none of it, neither of us could tongue fast enough. 
So I just sat down. I woodshedded it until I could double tongue. So that way we could both play the gig. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But otherwise, you know, one of us was going to have to say, sorry, we can't do this. Mm-hmm. Or teamwork, and you could tongue every other note, yeah. and she could tongue the opposite <laughs> notes, and you could divide and conquer, uh-huh. right? Yeah. <laughs> if I can find the part, maybe I'll go back and we'll try that together. We'll see how, we'll see how that works out. <laughs> Would you send that to us? And Alternate then... tonguing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a new In technique. stereo. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a... Freelance bassoonist, you are a band director, you are a father, you are a husband, you are a teacher. Um, How do you approach balancing all of these different aspects of your life and career, and what advice would you give about work-life balance? Uh, Well, you know, I'm very fortunate to be a teacher, and, and one of the things, one of the great benefits is that you have the summer to regroup. You know, mm-hmm. so this summer I did a lot of read making. I have 15 blanks ready to go, um, which, you know, now that the freelance season is picking up, um, I need to start working on this. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, you know, you need to be prepared um, just to put a lot of hours in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't say that we're always balanced, but, you know, when come Christmas time and there you have all your church orchestra gigs and the Nutcracker and everything happening, you know, sometimes we'll be both putting in 16-hour days. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our kids be like, what, you're not home again tonight? Right. Maybe next month. <laughs> <laughs> See you but, never, kids. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, at some point you just, I think that's in any occupation too. At some point if you need to get where you need to be, you just need to be prepared to put in a lot of hours. Mm-hmm. That's good and then, advice. you know, squeeze practicing in when you can too. Right. Mm-hmm. So in your career as a bassoon pedagogue and possibly as a band director as well, do you find yourself giving common advice to young musicians? I guess what I'm trying to say is, is there something you find yourself saying over and over? Is there a common issue you find with the young musicians you work with? Yeah, well, I think in this day and age where there's so much much technology, and so many things we can be doing Mm -hmm. that our life gets kind of fragmented. And so as much as I can encourage them just to, you know, you need to unplug and sit there in your practice room in woodshed because we're all looking for a quick fix. Yeah. But, you know, 95% of the time, those fixes are going to be coming from repetitions, repetitions, repetitions. What about advice you can give us on reed making, says the oboist. (laughs) (laughs) Well, um, you know, for a lot of years, I'm not even sure I should put this in podcast, but for a lot of years, I used reeds that, you know, one of our uh, colleagues made. Mm. He made an abundance of reeds, and he would give us, like, a box full of, like, 100 blanks. And, um, you know, we would go pick through there and find ones we liked. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it's important to to tailor your reeds to your own playing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so over the past... You know, four or five years, I've gotten much more serious about making sure I'm playing on ones that I crafted. Yeah, so recently I've been really trying to try some different experiments and try some different styles of reeds. Um, and there's a great resources out there for bassoon students. It's uh, in ebook or iBook um, by George Sakakini. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been using that and encourage my students to get it as well. And then I also have been um, uh, taking some advice from Barry Stees. Mm -hmm. He has a great blog on reed making. Mm -hmm. And so all of my blanks at home um, are currently wrapped with rubber bands. So if you need to figure out what that means, you need to go read Barry Stees' blog. Um, But yeah, just fantastic resources um, are out there now that we have, you know, blogs and all the I stuff. So... In addition to the bassoon, you play a lot of contrabassoon. So I'd love to hear how you feel that's added to your playing or um, what increased opportunities you think the contra has brought into your life and any hints you have for conquering the beast. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so I really love playing contra. And I would say, you know, as a bassoonist, that's really my primary instrument when it comes to freelancing. Mm -hmm. I play with the Columbus Symphony... Um, with the ballet and whatnot when they need contra. Occasionally when they do Ride of Spring with the Atlanta Symphony, I get to go in and play that. Okay. Um, and that was actually my first gig in Atlanta was um, I had 
come to town. Um, I was just getting to know the all the players in town. So I went and got a lesson with Dan Dowdekin, who was the contra player in the Atlanta Symphony 20-something years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he introduced me to Carl Nietzsche, the principal, um, after a lesson or two. And right as spring was coming up in their season, and so they were very gracious to hire me at a tender age of 24, maybe, mm-hmm. um, to uh, play fourth in contra for right of spring. And that just it blew my mind. Um, but there's something about the contra bassoon, just the richness of sound, um, I know it's not as technical as other instruments, but like in the Brahms symphonies, it just adds so much color mm-hmm. to what's going on. So uh, I always like to make the English horn player in front of me turn around and smile. That's always good. Yeah. When you can make the English horn player smile. <laughs> Better than turn in disgust, which is what <laughs> usually happens uh, when I play contra. <laughs> I'm not saying that that doesn't happen too. But, uh, Grass. Uh, but yeah. My favorite, my very favorite thing to play in Contra is Brahms' First Symphony. Oh, it just starts out with all these pedal, pedal Cs, which are just glorious. Yeah. And then <clears throat> on top of that, in the last movement, there's a great crowd with the uh, trombones. It's a fantastic Contra excerpt. So, so yeah. this might be a stupid question, mm-hmm. but what is the diff? Like when you switch from bassoon to Contra bassoon, what's the? Do you have to do anything different with your mouth shape or? Or with the way that you approach the instrument? Is there an adjustment period? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, no, I mean, I can go back and forth um, mm-hmm. interchangeably um, with all the woodwinds, really. I mean, a lot of people, I think, with their students are like, oh, you can't double on this or that. Mm-hmm. But starting clarinet, um, you know, I was... When I came to Atlanta, I actually did some of the Broadway stuff so I could play clarinet and bassoon and saxes and shows and things. So we did the producers, which was insane because I had... Yeah. Bassoon, contrabass, clarinet, berry sax, clarinet, tenor sax. And there must have been one more because I knew I had to carry six things into the pit. <laughs> um, but with, with bassoon and contra, I mean, the contra uses a lot more air, a little bit of a looser embouchure. But um, as far as, you know, advice to kids for playing contra, I mean, you need to find somewhere where you can get a decent instrument to play. Mm. Um, we're very uh, lucky here at Georgia State to have a fox contra, which is a really nice instrument. Um, there are a few other universities in town that have some good contras, but you know it's it's hard to get experience uh, because there aren't a lot of instruments out there. Mm-hmm. So you already said that you met your wife at a bassoon symposium. So I'm going to assume that's one of your favorite like double read day <laughs> gathering <laughs> memories. But yes. we are all here today for the Georgia State double read day, and so I want to know if you have a double read day memory that stands out in your mind as your favorite or notorious baby? Ooh. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's always a lot of fun to work with the kids here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, students that I have that go to Georgia State and then the kids that come in from the community as well. Um, so that's always fun. I also have some, some kids who have come from my high school, Mount Vernon Presbyterian School. Um, we've had some oboe players coming from there. And we'll have one tomorrow. But I think my, the most fun I had was last year when I actually played a contra solo. And contra bassoon doesn't get very many solos. Um, so I, was, I found one to work up for it. And so that was a lot of fun because I had to do a little bit more woodshedding on contra than I normally would. Well, and it's such a point of fascination for double read students who have never seen or heard one before. Yeah. I find and that they tend to be the most excited about the contra bassoon. And at my double read days, we get that a lot. Is there going to be a contra bassoon there <laughs> and it's this kind of like mystical being right for a lot of them so tomorrow actually i'm going to play a solo called peg leg pete um, <laughs> which is this it's this obscure like um, generic bass instrument solo. it's like for tuba or contra bass clarinet or whatever but i found it in our solo library it's like wow i've never played this so it's really fun it's got a little cadenza and it has all these cues in the piano score that Apparently there's a concert band arrangement, oh, and so cool. I I was trying to research that because I thought it'd be fun to do at the school that I teach at. Yeah, and uh, I even emailed Boozy and Hawks, and they're like, "Yeah, it's out of print. We can't get uh, it." You know, so I, I may just rearrange it. Well, maybe you know, one fun. of our listeners has it. There you go. If you guys have <laughs> the orchestral score or the band score to Peg Leg Pete, uh, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and flexible scoring is one thing, but the contrabassoon actually is peg legged. So this is true. I think we know what right. the composer's that, intent that should have been the original <laughs> instrument. <laughs> <laughs> 
John, it's been such a wonderful conversation. We always love to close by asking what advice you would give to a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours. If I were actually to do it all over again, I would have practiced a lot more as a young student because mm. I think that it just gives them the foundation. Um, but, you know, listen to lots of great players um, and practice and uh, get out there and play with other people. What is your favorite memory from being on stage? Concert, large ensemble, small ensemble, jury, whatever. Jury. (laughs) Tell us. Tell us. So I have to say that my favorite concert um, was actually very recent. It was back in February for the um, concert uh, college band directors national um, CBDNA national association um, that was held in uh, Tampa, Florida last year. And our wind ensemble got to play as just an ensemble for the college band directors. And it was just really fun to really like hash out everything with the same people and get to go on the road with them and just create good memories. Well, it's actually it's probably in band. I remember um, like in seventh grade, we were playing a bunch of songs like like Take On Me and stuff. And like, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really fun to do. Um, it's probably my favorite concert that I played. Um, we also put like other like lots of fun songs, but that's probably my favorite. Okay, so this one time I was at Georgia State and it's my first semester, right? And my director loves to make the transitions really smooth, and that's a big deal for us. So I thought I was gonna be smart and I put the next like piece of music on like the center flute stand because that's where I thought I was sitting. Uh-oh. But really actually I was sitting at like two rows back. So <laughs> Um, I didn't realize this, and, uh, like, I start walking on stage and realize I'm not carrying any music, and there's no music on the stand I'm, like, headed towards, <laughs> and so I, I immediately, like, go into freak-out mode. The whole time, everybody's waiting, and the piece, like, everybody's ready, and the conductor's, like, ready, and so they give me the music, and I go sit down, and as I'm walking to go sit down, I knock over the stand, and it's Probably the loudest sound I've ever heard. <laughs> not and a smooth transition. Yes, it was not a smooth transition. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget it. <laughs> never. <laughs> Traumatizing. So when I was in eighth grade, and I'm a sophomore now, so we have this performance at our school called Fringe Festival. So I don't normally get to play with an orchestra just because we have orchestra for strings and band for woodwinds and brass. But for Fringe, you you combined um, a few people from the band and most of the orchestra. So you know, you get the music a couple weeks in advance, you practice it, you know it, you're pretty good, you get to the performance. So I'm sitting next to this oboe player who graduated that year, really good at playing the oboe. At least in my opinion, because I just started. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm using this really old store bought reed, and it'll be great. And so we start to play um, Mendelssohn. Mm-hmm. And my reed decided to squeak as loud as it possibly oh, could. Oh no. And it died in the middle of the concert. Oh and I'm no. Like, what do I do? I don't have a backup reed. So I keep trying to play it. Like maybe I'm just not blowing hard enough. I bite down as hard as I possibly can. If you've ever put it up on me, this is not a good idea. <laughs> and blow. 
So I just emit this long, drawn out, out of tune squeak. Hug! <laughs> this is not a good idea. Um, my favorite memory was when our high school played the static waters. Um, one thing that was really hard for me was I never counted the rest. And there's like a bajillion rest throughout that piece. Uh oh. And so I would just be like, just counting at, or, or counting, and then, <laughs> and then when I don't come in, my teacher would yell at me, and then it, I was happy at the end because I finally learned how to count my rest. My favorite concert was um, last year I went to McEachern High School and we performed in the Music for All um, Festival here at Georgia State, and um, that was pretty fun. The music was um, great. We got high rewards, or we received high honors for it. Um, actually, our last piece, Magnolia Star, one of the, um, I guess, adjudicators, he came on stage and told us he absolutely hated the piece, but it wasn't because of how we played it, it was because he just generally hated the piece. And overall, that um, was a very good day for me. here with Dr. Laura Dahl, friend of the podcast and senior lecturer at Georgia State University, where she is also our host for the Georgia State Double Read Day. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> um, could we start off by having you tell us how you came to play the oboe in the first place? Sure. So my dad is a band director, and he has five children. I'm one of five, and he wanted to have a woodwind quintet really, really bad. <laughs> and so he picked our instruments for us. So I really had no choice, but he kind of picked them based on her personality. So my oldest sister, she's super nice. She got the clarinet, and then I got the oboe, which I really don't think is a compliment. <laughs> And then my brother, he kind of, he was, they wanted him to be a nice guy, well, so they gave him trombone. And then, so that kind of left out the woodwind quintet. Yeah. My little sister, they tried to do bassoon, but she gave up after two weeks. Okay. And went to uh, musical theater. <laughs> She's the black sheep. And then my little brother did the French horn. <laughs> okay. We were so close. <laughs> but he um, started brainwashing me from a very young age. You're going to play the oboe. That's what you're going to play. And I remember being at a concert and there was a man playing an oboe concerto on the stage, and he looked like he was about to die. Like, his face was red. And he, I mean, no one looks good when they play the oboe, and he right. looked terrible. And my dad leans over and whispers to me, that's what you're going to play. <laughs> no! Like, yeah, I know. Yeah. And so, obviously, he chose well, because here I am. <laughs> so tell us more about where you went to school, your training, educational journey, and how you came to Georgia State. Okay, so I did my undergrad at Brigham Young University with Gerilyn Giovanetti and did four years there. And then Martin Shuring came and did a master class my senior year and um, really liked him. And so I went to Arizona State and I ended up doing my master's and my doctorate there. And at that point, I had finished my coursework. I was writing my dissertation and I um, went back to Utah and I was a sabbatical replacement at BYU and a sabbatical replacement at UNLV for mm -hmm. Stephen Kaplan at the same time. Oh my the gosh. Same semester. Wow. How far of a drive was that? I was flying. Oh. But so technically I had my residency in Arizona. I was living in Arizona, but I was teaching in Utah and then in Las Vegas and I was traveling back and forth. So your taxes were great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, but it was really great experience because, you know, just, and I was still writing my dissertation, but I got this college experience on my resume. It was fantastic. And um, then I ended up staying in Utah. I taught adjunct at Utah State. And then I um, applied for every single job that was available, all nine of them. And I got <laughs> Georgia State. And at the time, it was a halftime position. So I moved across the country for a very small position, but I think... You know, you have to start somewhere, 
And I was half-time for two years, and then they converted it to a full-time position. So I'm very lucky. So I planned on asking something else, but I obviously because we're friends, I know you're the mother of three children, and you're a professional oboist, and then you are someone who successfully balanced writing a dissertation and two sabbatical replacements. And one thing we talk about a lot is balancing work and life and all the different responsibilities and being a whole person in addition to being a musician. So how do you approach that? It is so hard. And I, I mean, I really, I don't know that I've achieved work-life balance, but I have um, a six-year-old daughter and I have four-year-old boy-girl twins. And it has been really, really intense for the last four years. So my daughter turned two 15 days before the twins were born. And it, I mean, and I've kept my job through the whole thing. And the more independent they get, the older they get, the better life balance I have like, mm-hmm. and the more work I can do. But, um, I mean, I, I, I really enjoy work. I really enjoy my career. I really like leaving the kids a couple days a week and going to work, you know. Mm-hmm. But I also really like my time with them, and I really want to be involved in their lives. It's mm-hmm. just hard. And I, I feel like I'm burning the candle at both ends, but that's kind of what I have to do right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the hardest thing is finding time for me. That's what gets left out. I have time for my students. I have time for my children, but I don't have time for me. Right. And maybe that will just come a little bit later. <laughs> Fingers I crossed. Hope. <laughs> I hope. So, in as an experienced teacher, um, what is some advice that you find yourself giving a lot over and over again to the students who come through your studio? Well, so I was lucky enough to have my whole studio here today when I was going through these questions. And I said, what, <laughs> what advice do I give you guys? <laughs> they said, what don't you listen to? <laughs> yeah. So they said, be on time. Um, don't compare yourself to other people. And you have to learn how to play in tune. But playing in tune is difficult. It never gets any easier. Get used to it. And they said it's pretty much not what I say, but how I say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all solid, though. Yeah. That's all really important. So it's a double read podcast. We have to ask about reads. So give us your best advice, read making strategies, balancing practice and read making. Solve all of our read problems with the next answer. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> really confident in my ability to teach read making and I feel like a lot of that is from studying with Martin Schuring he's such a rational analytical person and he has just broken it down and so when I first was making these it was like a mystery and everybody you know like I don't I don't know how to do this I don't know what to scrape on but it's all a process and I think it's really important for a beginning read maker to make the read look right. Like it needs to look good. And you want to take out as many variables as possible. You don't want to go messing around with a shaper tip or your gout or your cane until you know how to make a read. And then you can experiment with those things. But I think you need to keep as many variables as possible out of the equation and find consistency in your read making. And I uh, have all my students mark their proportions. Where does your tip start? Where does your heart start? Where does your back start? Let's make the same read every single time. Let's make sure that read looks just like a read every single time. And when you can do that, then you can really start working with that. And in doing that, so in creating these proportions and making the read look correct, then you want to make sure everything is uh, proportionate to each other in terms of how much cane is on the read. So if you take a lot of cane off your tip, you have to take off equally proportionate to that off the heart and the back. The read has to vibrate the whole time. If you keep it all proportionate to each other, it's going to be a lot easier to work on. Mm-hmm. Great. That's great. Did I solve? Yes. The world problems? We're solved. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everything is, you know, you have to, um, I think, ask yourself a lot of questions when you're making reads. So what's vibrating? What's not vibrating? You can tell a lot about the crow. When the crow starts, is your tip vibrating first? No? Well, then scrape on your tip. Is your tip vibrating? Yeah. Well, is the heart vibrating? No. Well, then you need to scrape on the heart. You know, it's really mm-hmm. not that complicated if you're listening to how the read is vibrating, and it's all about those vibrations. So ask yourself a lot of questions, and until you know what the crow is telling you, play. Crow it. Think, I think this is what it's going to feel like when I play this read. Put it into your instrument, play it, and, um, and, and learn from that way. 
So crowing and playing until you can finally figure it out just through the crow. Um, what would you say to a younger version of yourself? Oh, man, I would give that younger version of myself a big hug. And I would say it is all going to be okay. And you don't need to be so worried about all the little things. Um, I think I would tell myself, be nice to yourself. Especially with music, you have to be critical of yourself to achieve your musical goals. You, you know, you have to be able to critique yourself musically. And I think that creates a lot of negative self-talk that becomes habitual. Mm -hmm. And to treat myself the way that I would have treated a best friend, just to be nicer to myself. Mm -hmm. It does become habitual. That's the biggest problem. Yes. Yeah. So what are some of your favorite pieces of repertoire? Usually we ask favorite pieces of repertoire, and it can be solo, chamber, orchestral, to play. And I'd love to hear that, but I'd also maybe love to hear your favorite pieces to assign mm -hmm. and to work on with students as well. So it's a two-parter. Okay. So I have my colleague here at Georgia State is Sarah Ambrose. She's a flute player, and I love to play with her. She's like my soul sister. When we play together, it is just perfect. So we do a lot of flute oboe trios and piano trios. Um, Dring is one of our favorites. I mean, what I love a the great Dring. piece. I, love the I Dring. wish someone could write more like that, mm -hmm. you know? It's just such a good audience piece. So we have done the Dring Damas. Do you know the Damas? Mm -hmm. um, love that. Just played that recently with her. Um, done some crazy stuff like the Musgrave. I haven't played it. No, uh, it's it's pretty intense. But intense. It's fun. The yeah, Musgrave. It's, uh -huh, yeah. The Musgrave. Yeah. So I we do a lot of um, of things together. Mm, awesome. Um, I love. I know it's crazy, but I love the Mozart Concerto. I guess you. I used to hate it. <laughs> Someone told me you will love it when you can play it, and they were right. Like I think the, the better you get at it, the more you love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love Baroque music. Anything Baroque, I'll play. Yeah, for the pieces that I sign, I think it's really important for an undergraduate to get through the the main repertoire for the instrument. My undergrad teacher, Gerilyn Giovanetti, was an expert at that. And so I think it's really important they learn how to um, play in all the different time periods. So within the Baroque realm, um, the well, if they're very advanced, the Vivaldi C minor sonata I love for like a senior recital of a student coming up to do that. Um, and then uh, there's the Telemann Sonata in A minor. It's always a good one to learn how to control your breathing and play, you know, the, the constant playing that you get in Baroque music. Then for um, Romantic, the Schumann Romances, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the Calavota and Palladia, some of those contest pieces are great. And then concertos, you know, I think they get a, everybody has to do the Mozart concerto. That's not optional. Von Williams, Strauss, if they really want to. <laughs> uh, it's a trap. Yes. I think Hindemith is a standard that they've, they've all got to play as well, you know, to have the 20th century music that's really angular and dissonant. And, um, I, and I think putting it together with the pianist is a really important component, too, yeah. for that piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are some of your favorite memories from being on stage? Past performances that stick out in your mind that's really special. One of them was um, just last year at Double Read Day, and we had the Sundance Trio, which is Gerilyn Giovanetti, Chris Smith, and Jed Moss. And Jed Moss is a pianist, and he played The Dream with Sarah Ambrose and I, and we played just the second and third movement, but it was just so fun. It was like you come off and you just have a high. You just feel so happy and it's not one of those times when you come out and you can say every single thing you did wrong. Mm -hmm. Right? You're not even aware of that. You just, in, it was just pure enjoyment. And I wish it was always like that, but it's not. <laughs> but that was, it was, it was just wonderful. It felt really great. Well, and those performances really sustain you through the ones where you can do that mm -hmm. and kind of remind you like they're a, a healthy dose of counterbalancing the ones where not even crash and burn, but just like, oh yeah, that was about a B, B yeah. plus, mm -hmm. but having the, that kind of highlight reel, Don Green calls it the highlight reel yes. of just like those knock it out of the park mm -hmm. performances can be so edifying for the soul long term mm -hmm. in addition to in the moment. Definitely. Do you have any other double read day memories you'd like to share? 
Oh, I do actually. She says <laughs> pointedly. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Well, so I listened to your podcast a while ago about most embarrassing moments, and I thought, I just, you know what, I can beat all of these. <laughs> and I really so can't. I mean, this this is legendary. Um, so it was in 2013, and I invited Nancy Ambrose King to be my guest artist. And I had never met her, so she didn't really know me from anybody. And um, so she came, and also uh, Lee Goodhue mm-hmm. from Ithaca at the time. She's uh, the bassoon colleague. I was pregnant with the twins, and that morning I was feeling really terrible. And so I kept popping um, Zantac, which is anti-nausea, and I just was not feeling any better. And Nancy could tell, she said, you know, I'm just going to listen to your rehearsal just in case I need to fill in for you for the for the artist recital. And I'm like, okay. And I, I, I made it through, and we did the recital, and it was fine. I, I made it through, but every time I could, I would go back and lay down and... It was my turn to do the master class. I made it through one student, then the second student came up and just finished playing, and I went to say, that was great, and I thought, oh my gosh, I am going to throw up. (sighs) And I said, I'm pregnant with twins, I think I'm going to throw up, I gotta go. I I put my elbow down on a chair, and I like ran off the stage, and um, when you come backstage, and and Jackie and Galit can see this, there's this tiny little ramp, like it just this tiny little slip, which you probably haven't noticed yet, but you will. (laughs) This tiny little ramp, and the door hadn't even closed yet between backstage and the stage, so all the the, the children, the, the kids on the stage heard me then throw up. I didn't make it to a trash can. I didn't make it any. It went everywhere. And it went on the ramp. So because I'm on this ramp and I just threw up everywhere, I slipped in it, fell fell down, and then threw up again all over myself. Yeah. In front of Nancy Ambrose. Yeah. Meanwhile, five feet away, Nancy and Lee are sitting in the guest, uh, the dressing room, and they hear it all. Thankfully, nobody saw it. But they stick their heads out and like, oh, we are, oh, I'm so sorry. And it was just, I mean, the great thing is Nancy will never forget me. And I feel good about that. You know, every time she sees me, it's like we really bonded. <laughs> it was awful. It was so bad. I, I went home. It, was, it turned out it was a stomach bug. I thought it was just pregnancy nausea. But my husband came to, he was on his way with our two-year-old, one-year-old at the time, in the back of the car, and he called and he said, uh, Julia just started throwing up, too. Oh. So that's when I knew that it was a bug. So I went yep. home, threw up the rest of the night, didn't finish double read day that year. <laughs> oh, it was no. terrible. <laughs> Once you're on that train, you can't get off. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> the story gets worse. Martin Schuring was here. He was visiting oh, no. because he was doing a master class at Columbus the same weekend. Carlos Coelho was here as a vendor. Midwest was here as a vendor. Shauna Lake. Like, it was like a huge, huge event. Everyone got to take part. And... <laughs> And everyone got to see my my puke everywhere. <laughs> my students cleaned it up for me. Like it was, oh. they got A's that semester. Oh, right? All of that, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, they all definitely. That is amazing. <laughs> well, you know, um, my mother was in labor with me for twenty six hours, and like growing up, if there was something like. I misbehaved or she needed me to do something, she would say, I was in labor with you for 26 hours. And so you can always, like, look at your twins, and if, you know, they didn't need to empty the dishwasher, be like, double read day. I know, right? (laughs) I just have to learn to say, twins. (laughs) That's bad enough. (laughs) Laura, thank you so much for joining us and for having us. I'm so excited to share in all the double read day fun, and hopefully this year is... More fun, but less eventful than that that <laughs> fateful day. Yeah, I hope so, too. It's going to be a great, great day. <laughs>
So what has been your favorite part of the day so far? My favorite thing about Double Read Day was um, just being able to play one of my um, prepared pieces and then getting feedback from it. Because mm-hmm. um, I did, I am self-taught, and so a lot of the things that I do, I don't know like what I'm doing wrong versus what I'm doing right. Mm-hmm. So it was good to see. It's always good for me to be able to have someone come in and instruct me on the right path of what to do. I'm just enjoying every second of um, just getting to learn more about my craft and be able to share it with people and learn with people. Definitely the master classes. It was both uh-huh. the most nerve wracking, but also <laughs> it was, um, again, uh, you mentioned how it's always a privilege to get to talk about the gray in the music. And mm-hmm. I haven't been the best at getting the black and white of music down before anything important so far, but I buckled down for this event to just kind of start fresh for the year. And so I was just kind of super glad to be privileged enough to work on the um, interpretive stuff of music. Probably like being able to be with other people that play your instrument because oboes and bassoons are kind of rare instruments. So it's pretty nice to be around people that you can relate to so much. My favorite thing is getting to see my amazing friends and colleagues do their jobs and be amazing at them. Yay! Yay. Perfect answer. (laughs) 